Hey guys, there's something unique and special about this brand new Audi A4, and it's not that it's brand new, it's that it has a new system that's only available here in Las Vegas called traffic light information. And basically, this car will tell you when the traffic light turns green. It's a pilot program started by Audi. Well, you know what? Let me tell you all about it, and that is coming up right now on the Fast Lane Car. This feels like a baby step, but nevertheless, a first step toward autonomy. Yeah, so like I was mentioning before, um, obviously everyone's aware of all the development that OEMs as well as you know tech companies and partners are putting into camera development, sensor development, and achieving as much <coughs> uh, ability for the car to see and sense its surroundings as possible. I look at this as a parallel step because when you connect to infrastructure, it's another channel of information for areas where the car can't see, right? So for instance, we're recognizing this right now as, as signal data. So as we're driving down the road, if this car was autonomous, it knows that it's going to be approaching this light and it's red, far beyond any camera or radar sensor is gonna see. We can't see the signal right now, but we know that by the time we arrive there, it'll still be red. So it could use that information to know that it has to stop. Uh, that's just one small example. So it's a parallel thing. And that's where we had that slide that shows like, you have all the sensor development in autonomous driving. You have the connected gateway, which is vital to be able to share this type of information, have the car communicate. And then you also tie in that uh, connection to infrastructure. Um, and that's how you really get the complete uh, experience in a true autonomous environment. Now, one of the questions that people may be asking at home is, why can't you just use Waze for this, right? I mean, obviously you're doing what's called Audi to infrastructure, right? So you're actually going to the source of the traffic light <laughs> yeah, <laughs> connection so, but but you know all these cars all these cars have phones and they all have ways right and so they know what's happening here google knows that there's a stoplight here google knows that there's a stoplight here absolutely and so does Waze. Waze is using what they call like swarm intelligence or right. or v to x you know vehicle they in this case a cloud-based server yeah. that's sharing what's happening with flow so what Waze is telling us is uh, where is their congestion and what the optimal route is to go here? And you certainly could use that and we use something very similar in our navigation routing uh, algorithms, right? So we pull various sources of traffic information through Inrix and then just push that down to the customer through connected online traffic. But with this connection doing to the infrastructure that is telling you about what's happening at the signal, and that's not something that Waze is going to communicate to you. So you'll see when we get out on the strip here, especially um, having that little extra information displayed for you um, does make for a more relaxing drive experience because for many people, and we want to get uh, over to the left here, having that little extra knowledge takes away the anticipation and therefore stress. We did a, a research study with MIT a couple years ago about, um, uh, I want to call it the road stress index, something similar, I, I'll give you the exact name of the survey. And they found that driving for many people are more is a more stressful activity than things even uh, taking an economics class at MIT is one of the comparable metrics, that was pretty funny. So how many um, cities do you hope to roll this out in? I mean, obviously you're doing kind of a pilot project here in Las Vegas, but is this something that, because of the decentralized nature of American government, is this something that'll work in New York, Chicago, LA? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I don't like the term pilot here in Vegas. This is a city that we were able to get online first. And the reason we were able to do so so successfully is because of the unique nature of how their infrastructure is set up, where we have one institution, one organization that controls you know, the 1300 plus lights in Southern Nevada. When we look at a, an environment like in New York or in LA, you know, when you look at a map of the city signal structure, uh, there are certain intersections such as this one that could be controlled by Las Vegas, the city proper. Two lights down, that light could be controlled by Clark County itself. And then maybe the row of lights on the Las Vegas corridor, the strip there, uh, the resort corridor as they call it, could be controlled by a third party private entity. And so in order to bring that entire um, ecosystem, if you may, or that community online, we have to go ahead and create a, a relationship with each of those. So there has to be you know, approval to access the data. And then they have to unify the data through an API interface, right? So then everything's the same language and then we have to QA it. So. Um, it sounds like a Herculean task. It really is. You know, we use yeah. the term trailblazing here because what we're doing is not just exclusive to Audi. When we, when we work with the partners, TTS and the municipalities to get this data online, uh, anybody could access this feed if they had the equipment in their car. So it, it will eventually be something that you will see other OEMs tap into. Uh, but it is. Herculean is a good word. There's a lot of work that gets the, going uh, goes into getting it sitting online. And on top of it, Sometimes their infrastructure needs to be upgraded to support this this level of um, interface. I am um, a little terrified of autonomous cars, and I'll tell you why. Because I've got this theory, right? 
about 30,000 people a year die on uh, our highways, mm -hmm. and most of that is human error. Yeah, they say something like 95%. Right, yeah. That's, you know, machines usually don't make mistakes. People make mistakes. And, and like, for instance, I was driving home from work the other day, and there was actually somebody playing a video game on their phone as they were driving down the highway. I was in my truck, I was looking down at them, and it just terrified me. Um, so I think that kind of thing will certainly drive autonomous self-driving piloted cars, whatever you want to call it. But what scares me is that what I think happen is cities like maybe Vegas or maybe London, certainly, will say, if you want to come into the city to alleviate accidents, congestion, better fuel economy, you're going to have to go autonomous, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll push a button and you'll be autonomous and the car will drive itself, which would be great because in traffic or stop and go, it's no fun driving a car. Absolutely. But my fear is that one day that option for that button will go away, right? Some politician will say, you know, guys, we can save a lot more lives if if that button goes away, and then you'll have to go to someplace like, let's say, Las Vegas, um, and out in the country to actually be able to drive a car. That's 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 the fear that I have. So I think you're posing a question that we, as, a, as employees in an organization, have posed many times, like, what happens to the driver? Uh, I mean, the good news is that as quickly as autonomous driving is going to come. Hey, we're back. There we go. Here we go. Um, yeah. Now, we're, now we've got 21 seconds to, to have a drag race. But you're saying at, at four seconds. At four it seconds, just, it'll pull away here. Yeah. And you'll look up. So, um, but like, okay, so let's say the first car, true level, let's go level four. So level four being that the car can handle the majority of all tasks uh, by itself, yeah. um, including some. You have the big caveat being some critical or uh, high importance situations and be able to take some <laughs> evasive or uh, independent safety actions, i.e. driver's not responsive, that a car will signal pull over to the side of the road or be able to swerve out of some objects. Level five is true robo taxi uh, level of autonomy. But let's say level four comes in the next five years where it's commonplace. So we have, we have infrastructure, road quality to be able to, to see that. We have regulations that allow this behavior to happen and we have vehicles on the road. There's still how many millions of legacy products on the road that would have to be taken out of the equation to be in an exclusive autonomous environment. That's gonna take decades for that purge, so to speak, to happen. To your point, there may be zones, but even that's gonna be a long time away. I do think, and this is a non- I hope you're right. I, I, this is, again, just looking at the present landscape and how the world, how quickly the world changes. We've got two minutes to talk, dude. We, we have some time. Yeah, we have some time now. But uh, I just, it can't. I mean, unless <laughs> there's going to be some major subsidies. Where everyone gets a new car. It's Oprah. Uh, yeah. it, isn't, it isn't going to happen that quickly where it's a, a truly a full autonomous world. I mean, there'll be, there'll be areas, there'll be zones, and there'll be products, but it'll be... I mean, look at electric, electric cars. I mean, potentially they could be everywhere, but unfortunately it's still a very costly and expensive concept. Yeah. Um, it takes long. Concept. It takes longer than we think it will take. Yeah. I think we actually do a um, pretty horrible job here in America in timing lights. I think because of the kind of the federalist nature of our government, we've got all these different municipalities. Yeah. It's never, I, I was in Prague for a while, and there's a road there called Evropska, which is a road that goes from kind of the center of Prague or the outskirts of the airport. Uh, and even under the communists, and this is like going back to the 80s, right? You, they would time those lights so you could go probably five or maybe even like 10 kilometers and hit every one that's green. Wow. Right? And, and I think that's because they had a very centralized government. Sure. And, and, you know, there was a lot more control as opposed to the autonomy that we have with our kind of municipal, federal, state levels. Yeah. Uh, well, and then again, it goes back to the point I was making earlier about like the fragmentation of who's even running the lights. And then, you know, is this private sector third party light management company talking to Clark County to make sure that those two signals, which are adjacent to one another, are they actually, you know, in sync? It's yeah. a Herculean task, yeah. dude. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, are there any other cities that you're talking to right now, you know, that there might be? Absolutely. There's, uh, there's plenty of municipalities, you know, we've been working over the years uh, via TTS. Uh, with many different cities, and then when we made the announcement in August that um, sure okay, yeah. you know steps were in place to activate this by the end of the year, it really motivated many other communities in the United States who want to be seen as leaders in you know uh, smart city uh, development uh, have have reached out. But to the point made earlier, um, because of the complexities of each individualized system, excuse me, um, 
it, it's going to take a little time. So sure. customers in other parts of the country will have access to this technology? Absolutely, absolutely. The goal is to provide this to as many of our customers and, as possible. And what, what models will have it? I mean, eventually I suspect all of them will have it, yeah, but, but, but in the near future. In the near future, so we're going through one of the biggest uh, product uh, change cycles in the history of our brand. So we started this year with the new 2017 Q7 and A4. So both of those models manufactured after June 1st. That's the caveat. Um, this would also now include the all-new Allroad. And launching early in 2017, we have the Audi S4, we have the S5, the A5, the Sportback, the Q5, SQ5. So we've got all these cars coming. Um, and then obviously future iterations of A6, A7, A8. So it will cross across the, the portfolio. Um, and what I like about it is, you know, um, here we're displaying this technology in the Audi A4. We're not using the flagship car. We're not using an $85,000 Q7. This is a, a technology that's readily available to one of the largest uh, segments of our customer base in the A4. So it's, it's cutting edge technology available today in our mainstream product line. You're the tech guy for Audi. Where are we going? You know, five years from now, where will Audi be and what kind of new technology do you see on the horizon? Well, I think we're going to be continuing our leadership position in connectivity and in piloted driving. Uh, you know, we're starting in the near short-term order with uh, the 2018 Audi uh, A8. We've made mention that that's going to be the next uh, iteration of what our technology presence looks like, both from uh, an autonomous perspective, being the first level three car, or we estimate at this time the first level three product on the road. Um, our whole new uh, interface with our new MMI system. Which it's going to be touch. It right. is to be touch, haptic. but it's not touch like you would think a conventional touch screen. It won't be like haptic. It is haptic. Have yeah. you been to uh, CES last year? Did you yeah. see the demo? Yeah. So the the buck that we had there with the, the yeah. haptic touch okay. screens, yeah. um, that experience is is in the A8. Uh, you'll see more here later as we talk about it. But um, you know, it was kind of a train wreck with uh, with Q, right? Cadillac. It didn't really work. Yeah. Um, obviously. At least initial version. Yeah, I haven't played a whole lot with Q. I know that the initial reception wasn't. The, problem with, the, the problem with it was, it seemed like it was developed in a stationary car. And uh, when you're in a car that's moving, you know, hitting is much harder than when it's just, you know, it's, 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 so it's, it's, it's a whole different animal. And the same problem with Sync, right? You know, the first Sync version, it was, the things were too tiny, it was hard to hit the right button. You'd often miss the right button, hit the wrong button, it got very confusing. Yeah, UI and UX are absolutely paramount when de <laughs> developing a buttonless system. Yeah. And if you remember the buck that we, we showcased, now it's, you know, we had some funky shapes to the screens and what have you, um, but what you see in the A8 is very similar to that. You'll notice that the primary input control panel is the lower panel, similar to where your hand would rest now with a, a hard button controller, designed to, to minimize that, that reaching and touching, especially at any, sort of, uh, any rate of speed. Um, anyway, we got off subject. So yeah, what's, yes, coming? what's coming? What's so, coming technology-wise? So obviously, there's that, and then you know, there's other future technologies that are on the horizon that everyone's exploring that we're looking at as well. I mean, you know, you talk about things like how could we use machine learning? You talk about you know further expansion of piloted capabilities, etc. You know, what's the next generation of connectivity look like? And that's all stuff that we're contemplating um, and and exploring today, and you know, with ourselves and, and our various partners. So I noticed that the fire truck came through, and once again, we, we lost our, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. our data. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's a good thing. I mean, to me, what that, that further showcases is, is the direct connection. It's an authentic connection to the server, because if we were just reading a timetable, right. the timetable would just you're, be showing the time. I promise you, you're going to have people going to the dealer saying, hey, it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> you know how that is. Um, <laughs> no, well, and that's, that's the case with, with anything. I mean, the JD Power IQS study points that out. <laughs> With everything, but uh, the key is, and that's there's a bit of a learning curve, I would say, to, to truly understanding it. But having that direct connection allows us to present our customers with accurate information, and accuracy is more important than something to show. We want the experience to be right. So if we don't feel the data is right, or in this case, it isn't right because a, a fire truck just came through, and and changed the signal timing, it, it doesn't make sense to show something. It just shows that it can't be displayed at the moment for whatever reason. In this case, clearly. Yeah, you, you, you also get a sense of just how much disruption one emergency vehicle causes in the traffic flow. <laughs> it absolutely can. And when you're in a place like this where the, the station is incredibly busy, it, we've, we've experienced, I, my guess would be at least two interruptions on this one test drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, this light is also not working. And well, so no, it's not. It is working, but well, it's green. Oh, it's green, yeah. yeah so so you, it, there's no reason. There's but, no reason to put it up there. Let's see if the next one. See, I think that one's also not, not giving us a signal. So give it a second and see. No. Nope, nope. You might be surprised. All right. 
I'm See you. what happens. Okay. It may or may not. See, nothing. All right. Nada. That fire truck just completely... Uh, screwed the timing up. Yeah, screwed everything so, up. So, having this is the best part about doing this here in Vegas and talking to RTC. So, when we experienced this yesterday, um, then they explained to us how these systems come back online. So, basically, the fire truck goes through or an ambulance goes through and disrupts it. Then they do a quick study of the traffic, like how much time was held at each section, and they run a, a quick profile that helps to quickly scatter the buildup, and then it'll roll into its regular or quote unquote more consistent timing map. It's pretty neat. It was like I didn't realize it was that sophisticated of a. <laughs> we Facebooked live the presentation, and one of the comments on there was how long before somebody hacks it? Can you actually reverse hack this? Or is, it, is the information mm. not, not going? You know, it's only well. It is going both ways, right? The information. It is going both ways, right, but yeah. different information is going both so what, ways. So what's going? What's going back to the the control center from here? So we get uh, back to Audi, right? And then Audi uh, will do a batch of information at a set time, whatever that time is. So it's not nothing's going back to control center directly in life. Right it's going now. to Audi. It's going to Audi. So we have a couple different things. So you have the municipal traffic system, which passes out the data to our data uh, curator, which is TTS. They then pass the data to Audi servers. Your car has an authentication token, a highly secure token, like any other device, like your phone or anything else that, that requests information uh, from various servers, and um, it opens up that channel. So what's being sent back to Audi are specifics, things like um, GPS, location, time, in phase information. So this is what we call anonymized data. There's no VIN, no vehicle specific information. We don't know who it is, we don't care. Uh, but what it does is we can say like, based on how far away you are from the traffic signal, and when we determine the traffic signal to have turned green, how long did it take you to get through that intersection? We can determine a flow, for instance. And we can say that if, based on the average length of a car, let's say it's 20 feet, I'm just using basic right. numbers here. And you're 60 feet back, you're the third car in line. Okay, so if you don't make the signal and it was open for 18 seconds or something, that means that there was congestion there for whatever reason you couldn't get through. So after you get a, a collection of those samples and you have a batch that shows you the behavior of the intersection or the flow of the intersection, we can send that back to Las Vegas. Then they can sit and go, all right, well, Tropicana, at these signals, traffic gets held up for whatever reason. We either need to A, adjust the timing, or you know, look at other ways, potentially even you know, remove or move a, a signal to better enhance traffic flow. So what's neat about it is you know, on the front side, it's a countdown timer, but on the back side, it's collecting data points on the arterial structure that the municipalities can use to improve traffic for everyone. So even an individual in a, a legacy product like the, the, the person here driving the, the Tucson, who doesn't have this connected experience, based on what they learn from these Audi cars, they can adapt the signal timing Straight. and make their life better. We're going to turn left. Yeah, I thought so. Um, so everyone... And, and the reason the reason you don't provide like how long green lights are staying green is so that you don't encourage people to speed up and try to get through the green light, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, you know, we really believe in trying to provide the, the appropriate amount of information, right? The virtual cockpit does a fantastic job of displaying the type of information that you want, when you want, where you want it. But if you're trying to manage mentally how long you have in green, how long you have in red, that, that, that becomes a, a complex situation. So if we reduce it down to one of those categories, and, and red light being the most important, if I'm approaching this light and the counter starts up and it's green, I know I'm not going to make it. And that's, that's a decision I can make. But if I'm counting down how long it's left to green, that's going to make you, to your point, potentially either think about speeding up or then all of a sudden the counter now switches to how long it's going to be red. It's just too much information all at once. So. Um, Play when it's red and go from there. Now we're in a construction zone here. Yeah. Do you see that? So yeah. uh, often when there's construction, and again, it it's boils down to the simple fact of having more information allows for better decision making. Like, okay, I have 78 seconds. Whether you believe it or not, now I noticed you just took your hand off the wheel. Yep. I noticed that you just sat back a little bit. You're not leaning forward. You're not looking at the stoplight. You're not trying to see what their phase is. Is it yellow? No, it's still okay. It's still green. You know, trying to see, you're looking for the, the crosswalk timer. Well, the hand is red, so that means that this must be stopped or, you know, soon type of thing. You're just like, I got a minute. And you just kind of relax a little bit. Um, yeah, I do. I, I, I'll give you that. I did relax. I didn't even notice myself doing it. So I think that's a good point. And that's really the ultimate goal. Yeah. Yeah. So part of me says it's good, and part of me says it's kind of sad that, that you know, we have to look for two minutes in our day to relax. So what that says about kind of where our society is. <laughs> Yeah, right? I, I would agree. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm kind of torn because I'm like, okay, so I get to relax for, you know, a minute and a half. But, gosh, I, 
really that stressed driving that I have to relax. Yes, indeed, we're living in a brave new world of self-driving cars, and this is certainly the first step toward that. And the folks at Audi, and of course the folks here in Las Vegas say that this kind of technology will make it not only safer to drive cars, but less congested, and at some point even more fuel efficient. I'm just hoping that, well, I'm hoping that that switch that lets you turn the car from being autonomous to non-autonomous never goes away, because at that point, we're not gonna have a lot of fun. <laughs>